maybe they've got like a, a race car that they're racing around by battling with their brain waves. Or if they're playing a video game, you have to be able to hold a certain state to get to the next level. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. This is our most science fiction episode yet, but it's all about existing technologies. In her therapeutic practice, today's guest, Heather Hargraves, uses a process called neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is when you monitor live data from your own brain waves and then teach yourself to self-regulate those brain functions that might otherwise be automatic or beyond your conscious control. Its main function is in bringing your body's own internal functioning into your awareness to help you control or at least navigate your own embodiment in the world. Athletes use neurofeedback to optimize their performance and can also be helpful for people with ADHD, stroke, and various other kinds of neurological issues. And while the field has been around for quite a while, there's still so much more potential waiting to be unlocked. So if you wanna learn more about your alpha waves and how to tune yourself to your own frequency, please enjoy this conversation with Heather Hargraves. Hello everyone, I'm very happy to have Heather Hargraves on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, I look forward to this. And so to begin, I just wanted to get your standard definition of what is neurofeedback? So neurofeedback is using a brain computer interface to offer the person connected to the device a means of seeing their own neural activity or the patterns of their nervous system through feedback that the technology offers. And can you give us a little history of the field of how we started to realize that this was possible and perhaps even very useful therapeutically? So back at Hans Berger, I think was, oh my goodness, I should know my history a little bit better date-wise, but numbers are not my strong suit. So I think it was the 1940s, 50s, we first discovered um, that we could record the EEG and that even there was the ability to kind of like interface with it. And as the field moved forward, Joe Camilla uh, started to really tinker with the alpha frequency and realizing that people could train their brain waves um, through changing their attention and their focus. So. He did a lot of work with graduate students, and then there was another researcher named Elmer Green who wrote a really wonderful book called Beyond Biofeedback. So anyone who's interested, it's one of those foundational books. And he actually did a lot of really cool research with um, shamans and different mystics, and he went to India and he was working with individuals there. Um, we also found that astronauts were going into space and they were having seizures. And there was a researcher who was doing research on cats and sleep, and he had noticed that they had a specific rhythm in their brain that seemed to change right before they were about to pounce. And so he was actually just using operant conditioning to train these cats. And he wasn't really finding that it was helping them with sleep uh, or anything. So he wasn't sure what it was actually doing for them. They seemed to be a little bit calmer. And then NASA approached him and said, oh, we have, we're having these trouble with astronauts. Um, somebody said that maybe you might be able to help us. So he said, sure. So he started exposing these cats he'd already been working with for another reason um, to rocket fuel. And it's a bit of a sad story because the cats who hadn't been trained ended up passing away. But the cats who had been trained were able to tolerate the rocket fuel. And they realized it was because it was creating seizure activity in the brain. So validation of neurofeedback for aleptiform kind of disorders in the EEG was one of the first things they really saw that you could use it for. And so then they started training astronauts that was helping them. I think they also fixed the fuel issue, <laughs> but it definitely helped them um, maintain their focus and not hallucinate as much and not have seizures that were causing the hallucinations when they were going up into space. Wow. And then the field has like, just continued to proliferate since that time. Because now it's seen as useful for a number of therapeutic um, problems. Yes, 
Yeah, I mean, ADHD t tends to be the one that has the most uh, research backing. However, we're seeing a lot of research actually coming out of where I'm from in the lab that I was at at Western University with Ruth Lanius, um, looking at dissociative disorders and how to train people who are stuck in dissociative states using brain computer interfaces, uh, particularly one uh, frequency that has been tied to call it the alpha bridge, which is kind of the mediator between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind, which is interestingly also tied to psychedelics and various altered states. But epilepsy, ADHD, um, depression, anxiety, like there's pretty big clinics across the globe now that treat a wide variety. It's also really useful for concussions. I've got a lot of uh, runway with individuals who've been concussed and been told that there's really no other care or treatment for them. But then when we start using various brain computer interfaces and various treatment protocols that are based on their unique EEG. So what's nice about neurofeedback is we're actually meeting people where they're at. So we see what their brain is actually doing. And then from there, we start training them. So it's like a physiotherapist walks up to you and looks at your body and formally assesses you before they give you the gym exercises instead of going to the doctor and them just hearing your complaints and then just prescribing you a medication. So it's actually based on data from your own brain. So we make sure that we're addressing what your brain is telling us is wrong. And so for the last foundational question, can you just talk about the different types of brain waves you're looking at when you're assessing people? Yeah, so there's it depends how detailed you want to get, but I'll keep it really simple. So each of these brain waves can sometimes be broken down into smaller groups. But the easiest way to describe brain waves is to imagine that the slower the wave, the deeper it's coming from inside the body. So delta is the mm. slowest wave and delta is between one to four hertz. And it tends to be mostly tied to um, brainstem, kind of your gut, really deep embodied automatic processes. Then we have theta waves and theta waves are a lot more tied to the limbic system and our limbic system is more our emotional capacity. So this is the thing that we share with any animal that cuddles or has mirror neurons or wants to connect. And it's kind of what really allows us to be social um, and integrative in that way. Then we have, and Delta and theta waves are kind of seen as more of our subconscious or embodied cognition, more symbolic as well, because they represent more of a felt intuitive state. So our like fight, flight, freeze, our attachment needs and our uh, deeper connection needs. Then we have alpha and alpha is, you know, in psychedelic world, it has everything to do with the um, reducing valve that you've heard about. And it's like the mediator between the conscious and the subconscious mind. 50% of our alpha frequency, which is between eight to 12 uh, Hertz. And I should have said theta is between like five to seven or depends on different people will have different uh, qualifications for how broad these waves are. Um, but generally this is held. But when we go into alpha being the mediator, it comes from the thalamus and the thalamus is kind of like grand central station in the brain. So when information is coming up from the body, so driven by the heart rate and the vasculature and the overall like arousal or um, of the autonomic nervous system, that generates 50% of the alpha wave we see in the brain. And the other 50% of the alpha wave is actually comes more from the cortex and how the cortex or our thinking mind has been structured on top of these lower brain waves. Um, so individuals when they are in more aroused and awake state go into faster frequencies and when they're more calm or quiet they go into lower alpha frequencies we also look at something called posterior dominant rhythm which is a really cool um, metric for neurofeedback therapists because the speed of somebody's resting alpha can tell you a lot about how their brain is functioning meaning if it's going really fast they may be a little bit anxious or dialed up or sometimes it just means a really bright sharp quick brain and then on the other end of it a quieter alpha frequency can mean a little bit more of a calm state but sometimes it can also indicate uh, learning disability then after we get through alpha we get into the beta frequencies um, 
this is everything from 12 to 15 hertz tends to be what we call the sensory motor rhythm, which is along the midline and has a lot to do with our like mind body connection as well and our general like processing and starting to be engaged in the world. And then as you get into faster beta frequencies, more and more attentiveness. And then as you get up into like the 22, 36 hertz, that tends to be more EMG or muscle tension. So if we see too much fast beta in somebody's head, Kitty. particularly uh, spindling beta, it can really mean somebody's brain is like locked at high speed, like an OCD type personality. Um, then we get up into the gamma frequencies, which is about 40 hertz and above, and how far that goes is still hotly debated. And you know, a lot of this tends to also get complicated by artifact, meaning tension um, and body movement. But generally, we do see a lot of gamma in brains that are adept at whatever they're doing. So flow states. When somebody, say, really understands a piece of music, they may, when listening to it, you would see a lot of gamma in their brain because they understand it so thoroughly that it's effortless. Well, thank you for that great rundown. And so I wanted to ask you about the path that led you here because this is such a, a unique intersection of science and technology, but also brains and neural states and embodiment, as well as mental states and spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what led you into this field? Oh, it's been a very rich <laughs> tapestry of experiences. Um, I would say it kind of started with a car accident that I was in in 2001. Uh, prior to that, you know, I wanted to be an actress. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a pretty creative kid, a little bit of an oddball. Um, and in 2001, we were making, uh, my ex and I were making a left-hand turn on New Year's Eve and a car, we turned in front of a car and so we were broadsided. Uh, the car drove directly into my door, which meant directly into my hip. And this was before cars had really solid side impact beams. So I was crushed to about an inch within my life. Um, my mom said when she went back to see the car that she's not really sure where I was sitting. But my first memory is of opening my eyes and the jaws of life being inches from my face. Um, I was extremely dissociative, so my memories are very serene. I remember looking around and seeing people staring at me and looks of horror on their faces and yet I was completely disconnected from my experience um, and then it kind of like broke down into all these little pieces as they took me out of the car and I went to the hospital and you know I went on this really long recovery that led to about seven years of chronic pain I shattered my pelvis in eight places I broke my jaw in half shattered some teeth tore my liver I had a collapsed lung three broken ribs I crushed my heel they gave my parents, they said I had 72 hours to live, and if I made it past that, that I should survive. But with the pelvic injuries I had, the risk of infection was really high. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a long journey to recovery, and in that time I also lost my brother in a car accident four years later, which really mentally put me over the edge. Like I would say at that point I had a complete break. Um, I became extremely agoraphobic and was just really confused by myself and the world and the pain I was in and this legal system that I was stuck inside of that was not making things better. So I got a really good clinician that I was really grateful for. And she actually interestingly got me to re-socialize myself by going and petting cats at a local human, humane society because I was so afraid of people seeing me and looking at me that I just couldn't tolerate any sort of therapy she was trying to get me to do. She tried to get me to go sit at a cafe and just like be in a public place and I would have a complete panic attack and couldn't do it. But by re-socializing cats, I ended up re-socializing myself and I started really seeing the value of relationship. Um, I guess in hindsight, I see how she was doing her work now. I also started reading to a blind man um, and I read to him for 
I did both of these things for about three years. And near the end of that, I started volunteering for hospice and I started working with individuals who had cancer. And just through helping and through engaging uh, different people, I started finding myself again. And then I started engaging in yogic practices and breath work. And the more I did that, the more grounded and centered I became. And so then I opened a yoga studio and I had that for about a year. And I noticed I had a lot of people coming to me that were being prescribed to go by their therapists and they would stay before and stay after and they would want to talk with me. A lot of them sometimes would cry and a lot of emotional things were happening in the sessions, like in class. And I was like, man, I really don't know what to do with these guys all the time. I understand what they're going through from an experiential level, but I didn't really understand what was going on, what I should be doing therapeutically. And I did see a lot of snake oil salesmen um, in the community and just around the globe, right? Where $10,000 to learn specific meditations and some things were getting kind of culty here and there. So I felt really drawn to wanting to understand how to ethically do what I was doing. So I ended up going back to school and I had already done a degree in philosophy and it's so funny in hindsight um, now, but my favorite topic was always epistemology, like how do we come to know things? I'm just fascinated. And my favorite class was mind design and Android epistemology. And it was all about how do we, um, like how would AI work and how do humans minds work and it was all this debate around language of thought and connectionism and as I moved further in my career and started working with brain computer interfaces I could see how my early education started laying a foundation for what I'm doing now but when I went back to school the second time everyone was like oh you want to study consciousness and I was saying I want to study meditation but it wasn't that popular and it wasn't that long ago it was like 2011 but through school in my second year counseling course, a neurofeedback therapist actually came and spoke to my class. And I remember just being enthralled because after my accident, I felt like my brain had been rewired. Like I went from being a very extroverted, gregarious, kind of highly uh, sensitive and engaged individual to this isolated, agoraphobic, panic-ridden person. And I would just say, it just feels like my brain's been rewired. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know how to like find my way out of myself anymore. And as she spoke, even though I grounded myself a lot with meditation, I was still struggling with dissociation from time to time. Like I would just check out if I got too stressed and it would take a day or two uh, to come back around. But as she spoke, I was like, this is speaking to me in a way that is like so resonant with my experience. And I stayed after school or class that day asking her a million questions. And then the next year, I found out that Western was doing research on neurofeedback. And so I was instantly fascinated. I joined the lab. I started volunteering with them. And then it just continued from there. And then I ended up doing... Um, my undergraduate research in meditation and looking across different meditation styles. And we were developing a state measure of meditation instead of a trait measure of meditation. Um, there was a lot of measures for traits, like nine, but meditation is both a state and a trait. And so my supervisor was like, we should probably find something that tells us, are people paying attention to the meditation and is it different? for different meditations across different mental health diagnoses. And so we looked at six, six different types of meditation and then we kind of dissected people's questionnaires and what kind of mental health issues they had. And I started getting a sense of, oh, okay, there actually is some alignment with what kind of meditation we should prescribe and when based on someone's clinical population. Um, and then when I got into my master's program, psychedelic research was starting to become popular and we realized that there was an overlap between some of the dissociation work we were doing and looking at specific brain waves and the brain wave changes that we would see in the psychedelic literature that was coming up. So we were just like, well, 
what happens if we try to mimic it? You know, we're already mimicking what we see um, in traditional neurofeedback protocols that had actually been based on mystics originally. And then we noticed that psychedelics were doing something similar. So then that ended up being my whole uh, thesis research. And I've just continued with this pattern since, or this path, I guess. Wow. And so it just <laughs> unfolded one step after the other. And it sounds pretty natural, even though it is uh, quite a journey. It has been. Yeah, it's been a very interesting one. Like it's the further I walk and the more I look back, more I'm like, it's so fascinating to watch life unfold and to see that your own like fractal patterns do you know who uh they not be mendelbrot is do you know what mendelbrot sets are mm -hmm. he's but got maybe a, you should define it um it's just like these patterns that are recursive and repetitive that no matter how deep you go into them they just like continue to repeat themselves and he's got a quote i can't find the exact quote but I, it was something about when i look back on my life i thought that it was just a series of random events but the further, the deeper he got into his life and the more he could look back, the more he could see that there was like a fractal pattern essentially to his existence. Um, and it's just, it's how humans make meaning of things. Like I know that's part of it, but it is an interesting thing to wander the path, the path of life. <laughs> and it does, it's, it's so true how deep it goes. I was just reading an article about the fractal patterns of the human heart at yeah. a physiological level. It it shouldn't be any kind of one system in the heart for how it branches and and no. things like that. It needs to be somewhat random, yet always repeating in a certain way. Yeah. And it's probably true that that just expands out through everything. It does. And that's part of, I mean, when I work with people now as a clinician, I'll do a lot of work with heart rate variability. And we know that the more coherent someone's heart rate the more responsive they are to life. So if someone's too metronomic, it's almost like they're kind of biased and ex have high expectancy and are a little rigid. And so I often will start with heart rate variability because I want to work with that alpha rhythm, right? But that relay station between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, because I want people to be able to um, be able to move through the natural states that human consciousness can and also kind of needs to in order for mental health. You need to be able to move into the beta frequencies and also surrender to some of the deep states as like kind of like an infinity loop. Like you take stuff from the body, you come up into the consciousness, you make sense of it, then that gets sent back down into the body and it, it needs to work together. But when we have rigid... Uh, vasculature and overwhelmed nervous systems we can get stuck in like repetitive loops that aren't necessarily giving us freedom they make us kind of like stuck in patterns as opposed to responsive to the world and blossoming i guess into who we are as opposed to kind of feeling stuck and not like we're growing or journeying anymore we're just kind of reliving groundhog's day <laughs> in a sense it's so interesting because the terms you're using just sounds like everything you hear in and around the psychedelic world and yeah. the world of shamanism. And so yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about, I've, I've heard you say that you can kind of recreate psychedelic states using these techniques. And so could you describe what that's like and what some of the differences are between, I love that cat. Um, My cat is really yeah, old no, and no. grumpy and very demanding. She's a love bug, but she can <laughs> If she's not getting what she wants, she's very vocal. The best <laughs> ones always are. It's 15. Uh, wow, good for her. Are you done now? Are you going to go? <laughs> you can hang out. We, we welcome all voices here. It's so funny. Yeah, her it's great. Mork. She had a sister named Mindy, so Mork and Mindy. Oh, and she's blind in one eye, so as a kitten, she used to like... <laughs> get hit in the head with toys and fall off of things and kind of walk around funny. So I just was like, this cat's a little odd. And when she was one, I found out that she was born blind in one eye. And I was like, oh, okay, that's what's okay. going on. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Back to Sean. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Morgan Mindy. Speaking of, because he was like, Robin Williams was psychedelic in his own way. Um, yeah. All of us mammals share an endocannabinoid system. 
That's why you hear so many stories of people using CBD-rich hemp extracts for their pets. It works for dogs, it works for cats, it works for all of us. For the Plus CBD line of pet products, we only made a few tweaks between what we give to us humans and what we give to our animal friends. It's still full spectrum hemp extract with all of the rich fatty acids, terpenes, and minor cannabinoids that help the CBD to work better. It's still made with the highest quality to produce the most reliable hemp extracts on earth. The only difference is that we adjusted the flavor palette to make it easier to give to your dog or to your cat. With flavors like chicken, beef, peanut butter, and salmon, it's easy to drop it into their food and allow them to enjoy the healthful benefits of CBD. Try Plus CBD's pet products today by using the coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbd.com for 25% off. Give your pets the gift of health. That's LEXFILES at pluscbd.com. So for neurofeedback, how do you see this relating to the state of psychedelics? And what differences do you see between someone simply taking magic mushrooms versus working through a neurofeedback system like you would use? So there's the <clears throat> soup and the sparks in the brain. And so I say that I'm like a sparks therapist. And I would say Maybe that you should define the, the two the uh, terms. Part, though. Yeah. So the soup is all of our like neurochemistry and how like the like the wet aspects of us work whereas the sparks is more like the synaptic firing but they're interlaced right the firing sets off cascades of chemicals and chemicals sets off cascades of firing and it's this it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship but i find that i'm tending to focus more on the sparks so i'm more focused on how if we move our attention and our intention in a certain way how that can start to change the way the brain is firing. Now, psychedelics can do a very similar thing in the sense that they kind of like suppress a lot of the brain waves in the brain. And then through that suppression, there's kind of like a stopping of our top down processing and allowing the bottom up stuff to come up a little more easily, which then when the top comes back on, it's kind of like a reshuffling of the deck or as Imperial, the people at Imperial like to say, like, shaking the snow globe so that you don't keep going down the same neural paths. You tend to have a little more choice in uh, where you're going to go. So from a neurofeedback perspective, you know, shamans enter into psychedelic states all the time and so do mystics and mediums. So I think the human potential for doing that is innate and yet there's a wide variety of people and what they can do with their physical bodies. So I think that it's similar with what we can do with our psyches and what we're drawn to, that there's just as much uh, novelty and variety and option. But because bodies and, you know, going to climb a mountain or going skydiving or sitting and meditating or riding a horse is just so much more concrete and something we can see, the idea of being able to use your psyche and traverse through states and challenge yourself to go into different states um, there's a lot of people who are hacking flow and a lot of meditators who seek this, but it's not as easy to grasp by someone who's not actually put the effort in time into really thinking about it. It's not as overt. Um, so with neurofeedback, I can start making some of that capacity a little more clear and showing people how flexing specific attentional patterns and intentional states can affect their mental health and affect the overall uh, firing in their synapses, which can be seen on the screen or through audio, visual, or even tactile uh, haptic vibration feedback. So I feel that it can be really complementary. Um, there are people putting these two things together and there have been experiences where you can kind of deepen or expand a state using a brain computer interface. I'm much more focused on the preparation and integration phases around psychedelics and I don't claim neurofeedback to be a replacement. I feel it's a tool, another relational tool in order to enhance your understanding of your um, choices you're making and how how you're directing your consciousness and your awareness is affecting or interacting with 
a psychedelic state um, and your ability to even surrender to that state and give over to your body's natural like homeostatic capacity and to allow life to flow through you a little bit more so you're more like a surfer as opposed to a director or someone who's just completely avoiding the flow and not wanting to get on the surfboard um, we have seen um, that following certain psychedelic experiences, particularly DMT, when using a brain computer interface that's kind of mimicking that state by targeting the same brain waves or regions of the brain that we see change. This is basically what I did with my thesis where we saw a change in the default mode network, which is our kind of sense of self that is developed early in life and it becomes the like default that you go to at any given time. So like the basis of your fractal pattern. And by kind of tinkering with the alpha frequency, you're kind of modulating that state and using that modulation plus a couple of others after DMT, we sometimes reactivated a DMT state in someone because they're still close enough and the brain is still entropic or flexible enough from the DMT experience that then you kind of have more malleability using um, the interface before entropy sets back in and they go back into a more like settled default state. <laughs> yeah. Wow. DMT and neurofeedback. Yeah. A brave new world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, I think it's easy for people who've just heard about this, like myself, to think about the positive sides of psychedelics and neurofeedback yeah. and think about how people and hack themselves to just be better and more in their flow. But they're also really powerful for difficult things like trauma. And I think it's really intriguing that you're specifically trained in trauma because I know yeah. it's a really hard thing to do. My wife is a therapist and the okay. trainings for trauma seem like a whole different world. And so I want to know, when did you kind of realize you wanted to specifically train in trauma and what did you go for? So again, this is one of those like random unfolding fractal patterns where I feel like trauma just chose me because in my, you know, need to heal myself, um, I ended up studying in a trauma lab. And because we were so heavily studying dissociation, I was being informed by latest research, latest findings, and through supervision and coursework and study, I've kind of gone through a lot of somatic trainings. Um, I, there's all the acronyms in therapy, but the interesting thing is when you kind of study the actually underlying neurophysiology, you just start to see how the acronyms land and how specific acronyms may be better for somebody who's, oh, you're more in your mind. And so like CBT is great for you and CBT is useful for everyone. It just depends on what state they're actually in. But Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote a book called The Body Keeps Score, who works um, pretty heavily with the lab that I had come from, and then I was lucky to meet at a couple neurofeedback conferences. I even got him to hula hoop, which was really great. Um, One of the classic flow states, huh? Yeah. He says that walking therapy or talking ther talk therapy is like walking therapy for someone without legs. Um, because when someone's in a traumatized state, all of this like embodied content that we have, these slower frequencies, brainstem, limbic system, up into, you know, then gated through the thalamus. If you're being chased by a tiger, you cannot think about that tiger and you cannot think about where you need to go. You need to run. So the body actually has a system where bottom up is actually stronger than top down. And we're built from the bottom up. And individuals who've had trauma, particularly early in life, tend to have a really strong bottom-up uh, override, and they may never have built a very strong like cortex or thinking self to interface with this bottom-up. So they get easily hijacked, easily overwhelmed, and we actually know that the prefrontal cortex will turn off in a state of anxiety, trauma, vigilance, depression, dissociation. So using therapies like neurofeedback that are much more about embodiment and about the sensory world and engaging people in observation, 
because the mind or the body, I mean, doesn't know the difference between reality or what you imagine, we have to use observation and imagination to pull us out of hijacked states so that the nervous system calms down enough that our software can kind of reconnect with the hardware, which is the prefrontal cortex can start updating itself so that it can function better with like the initial hardware and the default sense of self that we have. And so it's kind of something that I've just come to through my studies, I would say, and just like a deep curiosity to understand this and then studying like various somatic practices. I'm really interested in deep brain reorienting right now, which is working um, using tension response and responses in the body to release uh, innate orienting responses. So a baby, the first thing a baby can do is orient towards a caregiver. And they do that through the muscles of their neck or their eyes. And primarily we're drawn to attach or to avoid. And if that orienting response early on is not set in a way that is um, allowing someone to be in a state of connection, and instead they oscillate between you know, anxiety or pushing someone away, you kind of have to work, I kind of imagine it like a tree. I have to work at the roots of the tree before I can start tending to the branches of the tree. Because some clients will go to therapy and they do a lot of like branch, like CBT, which is helpful and necessary. Um, but they just keep finding their branches are dying and they're getting really frustrated. Why is this happening? I said, well, you just may not be getting good nutrients. And so then we move more into embodied work with individuals who have trauma backgrounds because it tends to be more embodied. And for those listening, CBT is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. And it does what you're talking about. It makes so much sense to, you know, a Westerner spends too much time thinking and reading books. You know, for so much of my life, it was ah the body, that meat sack that carries my brain around. <laughs> And it's such the orientation I feel like we're moving towards as a culture. And even the word somatic, I'm not sure I heard until I met my wife. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's really interesting to hear how you're using different methods that if it is the brain that needs work done, great. But if not, look to where the body is. And especially the body keeps score. That's so much of the memories, yeah. the pain is already in there. It just sounds so tricky <laughs> to be doing this with such a vast array of people that you probably see in your practice. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, but I just, I don't look at people as if they're broken ever. I'm just like, well, your body is brilliant and its prime directive is to keep you alive. And I know there's disorders, you know, and we all, there's disorders of the mind and physiology where the nervous system can be attacking itself. Like, so I don't discredit that, but generally, um, the body is definitely, you know, we're geared for survival. And so I, when I speak, talk with clients, they'll feel like their nervous system is attacking them or after them. And we just go on a journey of trying to understand the stories that were created and why the nervous system is reacting the way it is and how they kind of got stuck in these protective loops. Um, and then as we slowly go through the narrative of who they are and the physiological responses that go with that narrative, we can start understanding what is your default and then how understand why it's that way, start showing compassion to that pattern, and then slowly starting to undo the knots and kind of rewrite the narrative and moving away from reactive patterns to more integrative patterns that if you have fear, someone with trauma may fear their fear or hate their fear. So fear shows up and they get really angry. But in truth, fear may have been their best friend. Yes, fear signaled that something bad was happening. So you learn to associate fear with something bad. But if fear wasn't bad, it was the dysregulating experience that was dysregulating essentially. And your fear did exactly what it should be or should do. So we have to renegotiate our relationship with our body's innate capacities and the spectrum of emotions and see them as informants, guides, sentinels, protectors instead of like punishers, um, suppressors, and like overwhelming states. That it reminds me of the quote uh, that means a lot to me. I can never remember who said it. The worst part of it is everybody makes sense. 
Yeah. <laughs> that all with what's happened to the people that seem especially hard to deal with, you, none of us would be any different than them if we yeah. experienced that sort of trauma. And it can exactly. be really easy to forget these days. Yeah. And what's nice in such a cognitive culture, when we when I shift into using brain computer interfaces, it's really relieving for some of these clients because we just start working through relationship by just helping them relate to themselves first, because they may be really reactive to a relationship with another because those were so traumatic. So the computer is kind of this, you know, unbiased, honest reflection. And I'm holding space for them. We're developing a therapeutic alliance. And then I start using the computer to help them reflect back to themselves. So they start being able to choose how they want to interact with something for the first time and reflect through themselves that's just objective. And then I'm conversing with them about how is that going? What are you noticing? And then I can, we have got certain metrics and measures and kind of averages um, that say, ah, you know, that's a relaxed nervous system or oh, that's kind of a stress nervous system. And a lot of people with long-term stress experience relaxation as stressful so they get they don't have a default state that's comfortable their default state is actually very vigilant so i say to them okay we're gonna like this is emotional cardio like it's gonna be uncomfortable to move into a more relaxed state but at least we can use this like visual guide that's giving you feedback to show you that that's actually your body's moving into homeostasis but yeah i understand that that wasn't a safe place for you before but in this moment you know, you are okay. And we really take the time to build um, or resource a sense of safety and slowly kind of building up somebody's sense of self in the present moment, which essentially is like rebuilding their default state, which is, I say, rebuilding their alpha bridge. So we want to rebuild the central frequency in the brain. That's the rhythm section that has a lot to do with both being embodied and calmly conscious more resources it, yeah it, it's an inspiring way to think about this i believe yeah it well it, it definitely like deep pathologizes people like because so many clients come in they got 15 disorders and i'm like so you've got some trauma and your nervous system really had to you know adapt excessively and it's kind of burnt out and exhausted and you're stuck oscillating between over arousal and under arousal. And you've just never had a chance to nurture calm. And that's just what your nervous system has trained. So we're just going to start training calm. And cool thing is, is that some people who've been through a lot of stress, post-traumatic growth, you know, there's a book called uh, Breaking Down is Waking Up. And it's all about people who've gone through psychotic breaks. And he's got an image in one of them where it's a circle and he's got a, a shaman at the top or a mystic and an enlightened master at the bottom. And he says a shaman is somebody who has a shattered sense of self and has to rebuild their sense of self and then comes to a sense of self. Whereas an enlightened master is someone who had like a good enough upbringing and then has to surrender their ego. And they're just different ways of getting to the same thing. But in the end, it's like a full spectrum. You, you need the ability to go into these deep states and to have an ego and to come into yourself into the present moment. And so traumatized clients, there tends to be a poetry in it as they start to understand themselves that they're already masters of state shifting. And they don't have the same blinders sometimes as someone who grew up in the, you know, with good enough and certain beliefs and this is the way the world is. <laughs> They've already had those illusions kind of shattered. Um, so it, it can be a, a cool adventure because they can have really powerful insights. And I learn a lot from them. That's, that's beautiful to hear. It's something, it sounds similar right here in the harm reduction community. My friends who work uh, with people with problematic drug use all the time, you hear them talk about the amazing people they meet. And the word shaman comes up a lot. And the idea that shaman is a wounded healer. They've been yeah. through what, you're talking about and, and they get it yep yep it, there's a knowing there and there is an innate compassion well everybody has an innate compassion we all have c capacity for the full spectrum of everything from shame to compassion so there's a compassion in the sense that they understand suffering 
can they always show that compassion to themselves? Well, that's where the challenge is usually. But um, yeah, they they get it. There's a knowing. To be practical, if someone's listening to this and is really intrigued by what you're talking about, what would you recommend for someone who wants to start exploring this? And if there's any tech that they could even get by themselves to try it or ways to find a practitioner to work with? So right now um, is a really exciting time in the field because I think we're at truly a, the precipice of technology finally becoming accessible um, for a greater population. You know, companies like the Muse have kind of pioneered this, um, but they're limited to two sensors and there are some other companies that are starting to try to piggyback onto what they're doing and work with people from a distance, but there's still some limitations there. So if someone really wants to get into this, if you've got a trauma background or something going on with mental health, I mean, foundationally, you need to be working in relationship. So it doesn't matter what tool you're utilizing, whether it be meditation, brain computer interfaces, psychedelics, it's the relationship that's the key, the therapeutic alliance, and then whatever tool is put upon that should enhance that relationship. So if they're really interested in neurofeedback, I would recommend looking for a neurofeedback practitioner. There are big clinics across the globe right now, and then you could get like a QEEG and really get some insight from a skilled therapist. However, at the same time, I am working with a software company or called Divergent Neurotechnologies. We don't quite even have a website up yet, but we have partnered with a headset company called Newfany, and they are launching a 10-channel dry sensor uh, EEG headset that will be coming out this fall. And cool. our goal with this software platform is to create a platform that will be hardware agnostic and that can be used. It's going to be web-based and open BCI. So as technology comes out, you'll be able to use this platform to build your own brain-computer interface suite. You know, as a neurofeedback clinician, I've done that. I've got a whole Frankenstein system across different providers and different tech companies to kind of put together what I find works best with my skill set. So, but those are so expensive. Like I'm in deeper than thirty, forty thousand dollars plus the trainings. So. We're hoping the software platform is going to be one of the first that's going to start allowing clinicians from across the globe to work with somebody who has a headset online from a distance and to start teaching the basics of neuromodulation. And then as you become more skilled in that, you should also be able to uh, contact us to develop protocols or learn how to develop protocols for yourself um, to, as the new software or tech um, comes out, you can start piggybacking it and putting it together and then you could still be seeing your neurofeedback practitioner who's got maybe more of like the Cadillac system and in between sessions you could be doing these like uh, trainings with this headset at home and then you go see them for one of the bigger push sessions and the talk therapy sessions it's all pretty new but I think within the next year we're going to see a real explosion of tech hit the market um, that will be interfacing both HRV, EEG, um, skin conductance, like, and be offering a variety of feedback modalities. And I'm hoping to see my dream one day is to have like a renegade research art tent at festivals. So anybody could come in and participate in what we're doing. And then we could also be taking psychometrics at the same time and seeing what's going on in their brain as they're interacting, which I think this ability to start collecting more nuanced data outside of just, you know, the clinical setting could really inform our therapies, our uses of a variety of the tools we're using right now across meditation, BCI, psychedelics, so that we could really start streamlining and understanding the nuances of, you know, consciousness hacking or learning to flow through different states. I am so glad you anticipated my last sci-fi question about what you're most excited for. Yeah. Um, I actually saw one thing at Burning Man where it was a 
tent like that and you just sit back to back with somebody and you try to align your brain states and the glow of the lights gets brighter and more beautiful the more you align your states. And so for my last question then, could you tell me more about what you'd like to see for your art uh, installation at festivals? And if there's any other future of technology in the brain stuff that might be farther away, but you can envision that you're really excited about. Um, so I've had this idea about instead of like, I guess I'm starting with the second question, instead of Facebook, like state book, um, where individuals, you know, we have a platform where we could be sharing how we're feeling and you could enter into, and this would tie into like an art exhibit where you can really start associating different sounds, lights, um, atmospheres with your brain state. And if you've got a headset that knows you and it's got algorithms and you've been playing with it for a while, I imagine like divergent neurotechnologies, like where if you entered into an office or into a room um, or even into an art tent, the atmosphere would change based on the parameters set with your um, headset. But then imagine you were having a meeting and a group of people were sitting around the table and there was like a hologram or something in the middle and everybody had to enter into a brain state that was collectively harmonious or coherent before the meeting could begin. And then as the meeting was going on, the atmosphere would start to let you know if people were losing coherence, if they were no longer limbically resonant. And it might even have lights informing like which person is becoming too divergent or leaving the stage or too commanding. And so it would be humbling and reminding us more, I think, where traditional cultures uh, just naturally knew, you know, grandma would bring you into the center of the tribe if you were causing disruption and the whole tribe would hold you and want to understand, you know, what's going on. And so instead of like this competitive model that we have, we go back to more collaborative models and competition is still part of the game, but it's just understanding a little bit more of the spectrum and trying to focus a little more on collaboration as opposed to just suppression, oppression, or taking over. Um, And then, yeah, I mean, what I would really like to see is even in schools, because, you know, I have a 12 year old who is extremely disillusioned and and rightfully so (laughs) uh, by his education right now, because kids today have access to such a wide variety of technology that other generations didn't, and they're making use of it. You know, like he's on there learning about stuff all the time, and then he's in class and he's like, what the heck, why are we learning about this? So I feel that technology and insight and what the learning that kids can get is outpacing what the education system can keep up with at this point in time. So imagine there were like, you know, headsets where kids could be learning more dynamically, and instead of technology that's kind of preying on our attention, you know, if anyone saw The Social Dilemma, it really highlights how technology is being used right now, that technology that's reflective, like I would much prefer my son be able to play with his friends and if they want to use computers, which they all are, maybe they've got like a, a race car that they're racing around by battling with their brain waves, or if they're playing a video game, you have to be able to hold a certain state to get to the next level. So we're still training the limbic system and we're still training our default states and we're still training relationship and our sense of self, which is the foundation of a healthy, of like, of mental health in general. And more and more teens and we're seeing this proliferation of increase of anxiety and depression and not knowing really who they are because there's not as much reflection going on, which humans need. There's not as much relationship Um, it's more about consuming or just downloading information as opposed to engaging the information. So I would hope more like Star Trek, you know, where technology is supportive and interactive uh, and engaging as opposed to just kind of siphoning (laughs) our souls the way it is right now. Those are fascinating ideas. And that's from, and I read a lot of sci-fi and those are great (laughs) ideas touching on education, art, and business. Mm -hmm. Uh, Heather, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing about this. Uh, We'll have links to all of Heather's work in the episode notes, and hopefully we'll get a chance to get you back on again to hear about updates from the field. Thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, and thank you to Mork.
Yes, thank you, Mark. She's gone off. She's snoring over there now. <laughs> okay, good for her. All right, until next time. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. And please follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex File Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.